In order to make our neural net more accurate, we must first calculate how accurate, or at this point, I should probably say how inaccurate our neural net is. We do this by creating a cost function. As I said before, the role of the cost function is to tell us the accuracy of our neural net, of course, with our current weight values. We can achieve this by subtracting the output of our neural net, or y hat, from the actual known output value, which came from the raw data. The order that we subtract them in doesn't matter. We could have subtracted the real output from the output of our neural net. This is because we square the value, or in other words, simply multiply it by itself. One thing that this does is it makes the difference between the two outputs, or our cost function, always positive. This is very beneficial. Let's take a look at an example, and I'll show you what I mean. In this example, let's say that our neural net had an output of 0.9, and our raw data had an output of 0.2 whatever this data might represent in the real world. This would make our equation for the cost function 0 0.2 minus 0 0.9 before we squared this value. 0 0.2 minus 0 0.9 equals negative 0 0.7. Squaring this would give us positive 0 0.49. The reason behind this is simply that a negative multiplied by a negative gives you a positive. And when we squared negative 0.7, we multiply it by itself. If we were to flip-flop our equation and subtract 0.9 minus 0.2, we would then get 0.7. If we were to then square this value, we would once again get positive 0.49. And this is because if you multiply a positive by a positive, you get a positive. And when we squared 0 0.7, we multiplied it by itself. This is why you can flip-flop the cost function without affecting its value or output. This doesn't explain why it's beneficial. It's simply an added bonus. And I use this scenario in order to show you how squaring the cost function makes it non-negative. One reason why squaring the cost function is beneficial is because it makes the relationship between a weight and the cost function that of a parabola, and curved. In other words, if we were to graph its slope, or for you math people, the slope of a tangent line at a specific point, it is always decreasing and becoming less steep as you approach its vertex, or the parabola's lowest point. The reason that this is beneficial is basically that we can use this property of the slope to slowly approach the vertex and prevent extensive and continuous overshooting, which would look like so. To demonstrate why this is important in further detail and how exactly it works, let's see what would happen if we were to use the difference between y and y hat as the cost without squaring it. For a given value of a weight, we could examine the effect on the cost when changing the value of this weight, increasing it by unit, for example. Let's say that this results in an increase of the cost from 2 to 3. Because the relationship between the weight and the cost is not going to be linear, all that this is telling us is that we need to reduce the value of this weight to reduce the cost, which we want to be as low as possible. But it does not tell us by how much. We could choose to reduce it by one unit, and then see if we are getting closer to the one value of the cost that would be zero. Or we have overshot, and now the cost has a negative value. In either case, we will need to determine by how much we want to change our weight in the next iteration, making sure we do not get into a situation where we keep jumping from a cost of, let's say, positive one to a cost of negative one. What this means is that we could easily change the weight too much and never make the change to the weight to make the weight as accurate as possible. Okay, we now see that this approach is not simple and will require serious computational power to solve a real neural network. Now, let's see what happens when we use the cost function of the type y minus y hat squared. As I mentioned before, you can imagine this as a parabola. 
Now we can look at the slope of this function for a given value of a weight. Let's say the slope is a large positive value. Right now our graph might look like this. This gives us two important pieces of information. First, to reduce the cost, we need to reduce the value of the weight. But even more importantly, the fact that the value of the slope is large indicates that we are very far from the optimum weight value. And therefore, we can reduce the weight quite a bit in our next iteration. In fact, we could use a simple strategy that actually works to change our weight. We could simply subtract the value of the cost function slope for the current weight value from our weight. Let's see what this would do. When the initial weight produces a very bad estimate of the output, the slope of the cost function expressed as y minus y hat squared would be large and either positive or negative. Keep in mind that a positive slope would look like this and a negative slope would look like this. If it is negative, that would mean that by increasing the value of the weight, we will get a better estimate of the output. Thus, if we subtract the slope, a negative value in this example, from the weight, then we will do exactly that, increase in the value of the weight. Keep in mind that subtracting a negative value is the same as adding that value, only now it is positive. So it makes sense that when we increase the value of the weight by essentially adding a positive value, the cost decreased. On the other hand, if the slope was positive, the value of the new weight, which we calculated as the initial weight minus the slope, will decrease. And that is exactly what we want to do. Even better, you can see that as we get closer to the optimum value of the weight the slope of this cost function will decrease, making our steps towards the Goldilocks weight value automatically smaller, making our approach to find an optimum weight simple and computationally cheap. This also helps a lot with the overshooting problem. It is fine if you don't understand all the details of this explanation. The important point you need to remember is that it is mathematically correct to express the cost function or how different the actual output value in the one calculated by the neural network is as the square of the difference between y and y hat and that this has certain practical benefits when finding the optimum weights for a particular training set. In fact, we are going to change the cost function up for one last time. The new cost function will be defined as one half of the square of the difference between y and y hat. Why do we introduce the one half? The answer is purely for convenience, and you'll see this when we talk about derivatives later. Once again, I just wanted to show that there is a reason behind all this apparent madness. Also, I hoped I have convinced you that knowing the slope of the cost function with respect to a weight is very useful in a neural network. So how do we calculate the slope of the cost function for each weight? Okay, all we are trying to achieve when we calculate the slope of the cost function is finding the relationship between the cost and a certain weight. In other words, we want to know how changing a certain weight will affect the cost. The real way that programmers do this, and the most accurate and efficient way, that this is done is through derivatives. I will certainly explain this, however I will also demonstrate a way in which you can get an estimated value of the slope. First, we will take a look at derivatives, and then we will take a look at a simpler approach of doing essentially the same thing. And now derivatives. At its simplest, derivatives are just another word for slope, or rise over run. Usually, a slope describes a line, or a line segment. What makes derivatives special is that they describe the slope at a specific point and can be calculated on shapes other than a straight line. You may be wondering how there can be a slope at a specific point. After all, are its x and y coordinates really changing at a point? The answer is that it does not move at all at a specific point. Mathematicians consider this so-called point to be an infinitely small interval, 
around both sides of the point, which does have a slope. In the case of a parabola, the slope is the slope of the quote-unquote point, at which no parts of the line touch when extended out, other than that point itself. This is called the tangent line. The slope is constantly changing as we change the x value. Lines are a lot more simple because the slope is constant, regardless of what the x value is. In fact, let us take a look at a very simple example in which we calculate the slope of a line. Let's say this line had an equation of y equals 5x plus 2. If you know this formula, you can easily tell that the slope is 5. However, I want to take a look at a bit of a different approach to getting the slope. We can pick some input values to plug in for x in the equation. Let's start with some consecutive numbers such as 2 and 3. When we plug in 2, we see that 5 times 2 is 10 plus another 2 is 12. That is our output, or y, for these inputs. Next, let us substitute 3 for x. Now we can see that 5 times 3 is 15, plus 2 is 17. Then, when we subtract 2, once again, we get 5. I'll explain why this worked shortly, but first, let us try plugging in two non-consecutive values. For example, I will use the numbers 4 and 7. If I plug in 4, I multiply 5 times 4, getting 20, and then I add 2, getting 22. When I plug in 7, I multiply 5 times 7, getting 35, and then I add 2, making the total value 37. If we subtract the 2, we clearly don't get 5. We get a difference of 15. Do you notice the relationship? What is the difference between 7 and 4? 3. And when we divide 15 by 3, we once again get 5. We are now going to move to the derivative stuff. If you don't really care about this, you can jump to this time code. There will also be a link in the description where I show you how to use the idea of slopes that we just discussed to create a neural net without the use of derivatives. But I encourage you to continue. I'm going to try to explain the idea of derivatives, assuming you have never heard this word before. When we plug this imaginary infinitely small number h into our formula, it will look like so x plus h squared minus x squared, all divided by h. If you think about it, this really makes a lot of sense. x plus h squared represents the second y value, where x plus h is just the new x coordinate, since it is x, just incremented by h, and then we square it to get the y value, because that is what the function x squared tells us to do. Then, we subtract the first y value, which is just x squared. So far, this part is simply the change in y's. Finally, we divide all this by h, or the amount that x has changed. We could have written it as x plus h minus x, since there we explicitly subtract the first point x from the second point x plus h. This, however, doesn't simplify to just h since we can eliminate the x's. Here comes a lot of math, where we do basic simplifications. Follow along if you want. First, we can just develop or expand x plus h squared. This will give us x plus h times x plus h, or x squared, plus x times h, plus x times h, plus h squared, or x squared plus 2hx plus h squared. Now, let us add back the rest of our expression. We will now have x squared plus 2hx plus h squared minus x squared divided by h. We now see that we have a plus x squared and a minus x squared. These cancel out, leaving us with 2hx plus h squared divided by h. I now divide h on both terms, so 2hx and h squared, leaving us with 2x plus h. By the way, because we had h squared, or just h times h, when we divide this by h, we are left with h. If you remember, h is an infinitely small number, 
so we can consider it to be zero in the case of any addition or subtraction. There you have it. The derivative of y equals x squared is 2x. When we look at this on a graph, that is the graph of y equals x squared, and when we add the tangent lines, you can see that their slope is equal to the x value of that point, multiplied by 2. When x is equal to 1, the slope is 2. When x is 2, the slope is 4, and so on. You can also use this logic for functions such as y equals x to the third power and y equals x to the fourth power. And you will find that their derivatives are 3x to the second power and 4x to the third power, respectively. So the derivative of y equals x to the third power is 3x squared. And the derivative of y equals x to the fourth power is 4x to the power of 3. There is a pattern here. It is that the derivative of y equals x to the n power is n times x to the power of n minus 1. This is where n takes the value of our exponent. Let's try this rule out for functions y equals x squared and y equals x to the third. In y equals x squared, our exponent or just n is 2. So according to our rule, the derivative of this function would be equivalent to 2 times x to the power of 2 minus 1. We can then rewrite it as 2x. For the function y equals x to the third power, our exponent, or n, is equal to 3. And so the derivative of this function is equivalent to 3 times x to the power of 3 minus 1. We can then rewrite it as 3x squared. This is much easier than the method that we used before. Mathematicians have made many other rules that make our lives much easier. We will soon be taking a look at another one. I'll explain what it is then. Now, let's take a look at how we can get the derivative of our cost function with respect to a weight. Before, we were getting the derivative of y with respect to x. And this means calculating the slope for y for any value of x. Now, we will be calculating the slope of our cost function for any value of a particular weight. This is to know how much the cost changes and in which direction when we change a weight. After all, this is basically just slope. So let's look at our cost function. We have defined the cost function as 1 half of y minus y hat squared. But remember, y hat is also a function. We have defined y hat as the sigmoid of act a. Act a is also a function, and so on and so on. The problem is, how do we calculate the derivative of a function that is not just a variable, but itself a function of a function of a function? Again, mathematicians come to our help. And as I promised, I'm now going to talk about the chain rule. As I just pointed out, it is used to find the derivatives of very complex functions, or a function of a function of a function of a... Well, we get the point. Basically, what this rule says is that the derivative of a complex function with respect to a variable, which is embedded in a function deep down the chain, is the product of the derivative of the first function with respect to the second function times the derivative of the second function with respect to the variable. Okay, do not panic. It will make a lot more sense when we take a look at an example. Let's say we want to calculate the derivative of our cost function with respect to w out 1. Since the cost function is 1 half of y minus y hat squared, we can start by calling z equals y minus y hat. Now we have defined a function whose values will change when w out 1 changes. Thus, we could define the derivative of the cost with respect to w out 1 as the derivative of the cost with respect to z times the derivative of z with respect to the w out 1 dependent variable in z, which would be the function y hat. But we cannot stop there, because y hat itself is also a function that changes with w out 1. In other words, it is dependent on w out 1, so we need to continue applying the chain rule. We will need to multiply this by the derivative of y hat with respect to act a, and multiply this by the derivative of act a with respect to w out 1. Okay, finally we got to the end of the chain rule for w out 1. Why? 
because even though Act A is also a function of S Act 1, you can see that S Act 1 does not change when W out 1 changes. In other words, S Act 1 is not a function of W out 1, and therefore we do not need to consider it when calculating the derivative or slope of the cost function with respect to W out 1. That will not be the case when we calculate the derivative of the cost with respect to W, but we will see that later. Back to our equations. What we have is that the derivative of the cost with respect to W out 1 is equal to the derivative of the cost with respect to Z times the derivative of Z with respect to Y hat times the derivative of Y hat with respect to Act A times the derivative of Act A with respect to W out 1. All we need to do is calculate each one of the derivatives of this formula and multiply them. Okay, what is the derivative of the cost with respect to z? We said that the cost was one half of z squared. We don't even have to use our formula from before because this function is very similar to one that we have already seen. By the way, this function is very similar to y equals x squared. And the only difference is that we don't multiply it by one half. We saw that its derivative was 2x. In our function, we have z squared instead of x squared. So we will end up with one half of 2z. This is also just z, or y minus y hat. This is why I changed our cost function by multiplying it by one half. It is so that when we do this step, we end up with z and not 2z. It doesn't matter much, but it makes things just a little bit simpler. So we can now replace the derivative of the cost with respect to z by z, which is the same as y minus y hat. So now we have that the derivative of the cost with respect to w out 1 is equal to y minus y hat times the derivative of z with respect to y hat times the derivative of y hat with respect to act a times the derivative of act a with respect to w out 1. Next, we need to calculate the derivative of z with respect to y hat. Remember, z equals y minus y hat. So basically, we want to calculate the derivative of y minus y hat with respect to y hat. If we look at the components of this equation, we can see that y is the constant. Remember, y is the known output of our training set, so it doesn't change. What is the slope of a constant? Just think about it. A constant doesn't change, as the name implies. The other element in the equation y minus y hat is negative y hat. So what is the derivative of y hat with respect to y hat? This is the same as asking what is the derivative of x with respect to x. As we saw before, that is 1. But we want the derivative of negative y hat with respect to y hat. So it is actually negative 1. So now we have the derivative of the cost with respect to w out 1 is equal to y minus y hat times negative 1 times the derivative of y hat with respect to act a times the derivative of act a with respect to w out 1. In the next step, we need to calculate the derivative of y hat with respect to act a. This is the same as asking what is the derivative of the sigmoid of act A with respect to act A. Here we are just going to look up what the derivative of the sigmoid is. And we can see that it is e to the power of negative x divided by 1 plus e to the negative x squared. We just need to replace x with act A. So we end up with the derivative of the cost with respect to w out 1 is equal to y minus y hat times negative 1 times e to the power of negative act a divided by 1 plus e minus act a squared times the derivative of act a with respect to w out 1. The last step is to calculate the derivative of act a with respect to w out 1. If you remember, act a equals s act 1 times w out 1 plus s act 2 times w out 2 plus s act 3 times w out 3, plus s act 4 times w out 4, plus b out times w b out. Since s act 2 times w out 2, s act 3 times w out 3, s act 4 times w out 4, and b out times w b out, 
do not change with respect to W out 1. Their slopes are 0. Similarly, S act 1 does not change with respect to W out 1. So we can put the equation of act A as y equals a constant times x plus a bunch of constants. According to our formula, the derivative of a times x to the power of n plus b would be a times n times x to the power of n minus 1 plus 0. Since in our case n equals 1, we have that the derivative of a times x plus b is equal to a times 1, or just a. Or more precisely, the derivative of s act 1 times w out 1 plus a bunch of constants with respect to w out 1 is s act 1. So finally, we can say that the derivative of our cost function with respect to w out 1 is y minus y hat times negative 1 times e to the power of negative act a divided by 1 plus e minus act a squared times s act 1. Next, we also need to calculate the derivative of the cost function with respect to each one of the weights. Thus, we need to calculate the derivative of the cost with respect to W1 and all the other weights. I'll just be using this one as an additional example. I'm not going to elaborate on this, but just tell you that the derivative of the cost with respect to W1 is equal to the derivative of the cost with respect to z times the derivative of z with respect to y hat times the derivative of y hat with respect to act a times the derivative of act a with respect to s act 1 times the derivative of s act 1 with respect to act 1 times the derivative of act 1 with respect to w1 and if you solve these derivatives as we did before you'll get that the derivative of the cost with respect to w1 is equal to this right here. Similarly, we will need to calculate the derivative of the cost function for each one of the bias weights using the same strategy. Instead of writing all the equations here, we will look at them when we describe the corresponding Python script, although I won't explain it in too much detail. Okay, we definitely need to take a break from all this math and all these formulas. So as I promised, I'm going to show you how to minimize your cost function without using derivatives. The idea behind this non-calculus based approach is still based on the exact same concepts. That is, we need to determine the slope of the cost function for a specific weight value. The difference is that instead of using the derivatives as a way to calculate the exact slope for each weight value, we will calculate an approximate slope for each weight value using the computational power of a computer. How do we do this? Well, it's actually pretty easy. What we do is we calculate the cost of our neural network with the current value of the weight in question. Then we increase the value of the weight by a very small amount, let's say by 0 0.0001. And we once again calculate the cost of our neural network, now with our modified weight. We can then calculate the approximate slope as the cost for our new weight, that is the original weight plus 0 0.0001 minus the cost for the original weight and then divide the result by 0 0.0001. You probably realized this is exactly what we did before when I introduced you to derivatives. Remember, all we are doing here is calculating the rate of change or the slope or the change in y divided by the change in x, where x is the weight and y is the cost. And then, just like we did before, we will subtract a fraction of the slope from the weight currently in question in order to reduce the value of the cost function. This concept is pretty simple. In the next video, we will be implementing all of this into a Python script. I will go over this script that uses derivatives but I'm also providing two other scripts. One, where I use derivatives, but do not use biases. And the third, where I use the computer calculated slopes instead of the derivatives. I will also show you some examples of the performance of each one of the three approaches to make predictions for simple relationships and more complex ones. Anyhow, that's it for this video. If you enjoyed the video, please hit the thumbs up button subscribe, and hit the notification icon. 
if you have any questions or just want me in the community to see something that you think is relevant, leave a comment in the comment section down below.